Welcome to Dare to Dream. I'm your host, Debbie Dashinger. Pleasure to be here with you. And uh, this show, this show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and a Webby Award. I'm very grateful for all of you who listen and who write in and follow the show and recommend it to your friends. Remember always please to subscribe so this comes right into your inbox anytime a new show comes out, which is basically once a week. Uh, so you can go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger, and you know we are also on Apple Podcasts and all the main radio, iHeart, Spotify, BBS, etc. sites. So what I do out in the world is media visibility shaman. I help people write a page turner book. I take authors' books to a guaranteed international bestseller status, and I show spiritual entrepreneurs how to be interviewed on radio and podcast and get results. I myself have been interviewed in over 1,500 media outlets, and I use everything that I teach. My students are really successful, and it gives me a lot of joy to see spiritual entrepreneurs who are truly the light workers of today fly at a time when we really need their voice and their gifts. So that said, our show today is going to be as yummy as always, because I've got a guest that I have been very much looking forward to having on the show for a while, Heather Ashamara. And I also want to preface by saying thank you, thank you to Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness for sponsoring this show Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness do beautiful energy work out into the world and anywhere in the world. So if you'd like to go to a class in person, when that opens back up again, you certainly can. There are also programs online. There are books and products online. You can find them at accessconsciousness.com as well as Dr. Dane, D-A-I-N, here, H-E-E-R.com. Highly recommended. So the question is, how would you like to transform confusion into clarity and pain into peace? My guest, Heather Ashimara, is the founder of Tokai, the Toltec Center of Creative Intent, and the author of several books, including the Warrior's Goddess Training Series. She brings an open-hearted, inclusive worldview to her writings and teachings, which are a rich blend of Toltec wisdom, European shamanism, Buddhism, and Native American ceremony. She lives in Austin, Texas, and travels extensively. If you'd like to learn more, go to her website, which is Heather Ash Amara, A M A R A dot com, and learn more there. And Heather, Heather Ash, I welcome you to the Dare to Dream show. Thanks so much, Debbie. It's so good to be here with you. And I know the book I just got through reading right here, with some dog ears in it, uh, very great read. And so we have a lot to cover. I'm looking forward to it and everything from, you know, who you be and what you offer to what your latest book is giving people, gifting people. You know, one of the things in reading your book, especially in the beginning, you talk about the fact that as you grew up, you were traveling as a young child and then into your adult years, continuing to travel. How many countries have you been in? What does travel mean to you? Oh my gosh, <laughs> a lot. I don't even know what the number is. I think we counted one day, it was like 41 countries. Mm. Um, and yeah, I grew up traveling. I was uh, born in Hong Kong. We lived in Southeast Asia when I was young. Uh, until I actually went to college. So I came back to the States to go to college and then kept traveling. So it's, it's in my blood and I'm really grateful for the opportunities I've had to visit so many different places and people and ways of being around the world. And how is this time for you when everything's a bit of a screeching halt? How are you navigating this? You know, it's actually lovely. I don't mind at all. I'm this interesting blend of I'm a super homebody when I'm home. And so it's just allowed me to have a deep dive into settling and working on some writing projects and uh, being up on my land. I just bought 180 acres of land outside of Santa Fe. Wow. So just started learning how to make adobe bricks and trim trees. 
So it's been oh, that's phenomenal. Cool. Yeah. Very nice. What are you going to do with the adobe bricks? We're working on a building. So it'll be a kitchen downstairs and then a bedroom upstairs. And there's an old foundation where the old adobe house was. And so we get to use the mud from the old adobes and some of the old adobes that we, we pulled down last year. So it's just such a neat recycle project. Oh, this um, is great. Yeah, yeah. Major DIY on the home front there. Uh, so I guess I was most, uh, you know, I get a lot of pitches for the show. But the thing that caught my eye with you in particular is the fact that it said shaman. And I myself late last year received a calling out of the blue from the divine, but very clear uh, informing me that I was to open myself to being the shaman within me. You know, initially I thought, oh, I, I need to get further education. I need well, COVID put an end to all that. But then it became abundantly clear, maybe this is not about further education. Maybe this already is. Maybe this is many lifetimes of having been this, and this is a reactivation in a way. And so right now, you know, things shaman are very deep for me and really of interest. What was your journey to acquiring that name, if you will? How did you come by being called or being given the title shaman? You know, it's really been a journey around me reconnecting with the, that foundation of being in relationship to the earth, to my own intuition, to guides. And so there wasn't like, I went to school and then I got this title at all. And I don't even consider myself a shaman in a way. I consider myself a shamanic practitioner mm -hmm. because for me, a shaman's like someone that's within a community and the community bestows that name. And all of us have roots in shamanism. All of us do because all pre-religion, our ancestors were in deep relationship to the earth. And there were always medicine people. There were always the wisdom keepers. And so for me, it's been a journey of following my heart, learning different tools, exploring different practices, but really learning how to get out of Western linear thinking mm -hmm. and to come back home to cyclical, being in relationship to the seasons, to the cycles, really honoring birth and death, really honoring all the aspects of life that I feel is what's landed me in this shamanic wisdom that I'm so honored to be able to gift the tools and the practices that help us come back home to ourselves. You make it really clear in the book that you studied with Don Miguel Ruiz for 15 years. And I want to talk a little bit about that and your relationship with him and his work. Just to preface it by saying, Heather Ash, that I have had a couple of experiences with him, not 15 years by any means. And yes, on the show, but much deeper than that, uh, we had a friend in common, Don Miguel and I, and um, he's now since moved to Peru and started a whole retreat center there. But in, while he was here, uh, he used to do these workshops, you know, really big gatherings and invite people to ballrooms. So during one of these, I was invited to open the program and speak on stage. And we knew that uh, Don Miguel was going to be there and Don Jose, his son, and so forth. There was, you know, some pretty prolific people showing up to speak on stage. So here's the setting. Everybody's there early, including all the people handling the back of the room and the people setting up in the crew. And so there's a big hubbub. But Don Miguel has not yet arrived. And it's almost like the king is coming, the way everybody's acting. It was very interesting. And a door opens, and he's there with his people. As his, I don't want to say entourage, because I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression, because that is not who he is to me at all. But he did come in, but clearly there was a huge response in that room of, oh, he's here. And all these people rushed forward to him. And I can never say why I do what I do, but I don't ever have those instincts. In fact, it's probably contrary because I feel always so sensitive to that person, um, what that must be like. So I just remember going, I didn't have a back table, but a, something at a back table. 
And at some point after he was surrounded by all these people, he made him his, his way through the crowd. And I looked up and there was nobody else in that whole ballroom. He was coming right to me with open arms like he had known me his whole life. And he gave me a hug that was, it is not like anything I have experienced for most people and, and I love hugs. It was, it was very clear to me that he walks with love, that he is this embodiment. There's something so special and palpable about him. And now here he is, you know, maybe not the best speaker of English and you know, I'm not very great otherwise. And so there was that incredible moment where I just felt so honored. And, so, and when that was complete, and the program started, they went to line us up in the front seats. And uh, they told Don Miguel, okay, you're gonna sit here. And they were pointing out to everybody. And Don Miguel said, no, I'm sitting next to her. And he pointed to me. And he sat next to me and held my hand. And I just can't even, what an impression. Now I've interviewed him on camera, I've, et cetera. And same, he comes into my sphere and this thing happens that is so special and palpable. Like I've met many transformational people. For me, he is the real deal. So that is my Don Miguel story, which will forevermore be so special in my heart that he gifted that to me, that experience. And, and so 15 years you had with him. I'm so curious if you could tell us your story. There's so many stories, um, and I, I love that. I mean, Miguel is such a manifestation, physical form of unconditional love, mm -hmm. and that was part of what drew me to him. I actually had a dream about him in 92, and the dream was, this man is going to come change your life. Oh. And I remember waking up going, right, where am I going to meet this human? Because I lived in a really small town in Northern California at that time. And uh, literally a week later, someone came into my office and said, oh my God, you have to meet this man. And my whole body went, oh no, I am not ready for this. And it took me a year because I could feel like everything was going to change. I remember the first time I walked into the place where he was teaching, just feeling the people, the community that was there and their dedication and their presence. I was like, okay, I found my people. Mm. Um, and then I got to meet Miguel and it's been such a gift to be part of the family to, to have been with Miguel for so long and to be able to pass the teachings on because you know not only is Miguel this incredible embodiment of love he also his family and his tradition the Toltec tools are so impactful and so deeply healing uh, and so needed in the world. And so it's a, a real gift to get to walk that path and share. Yeah. And that's a huge transition for you. I just want to say kudos for you. 15 years is a long tutelage for you then to somehow know it's my time. It's my time to go now create what I came here to do using all of this soup and bringing it with what I came here with. How did you make that move, that leap into your own work? He kicked us out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, there was, there was a point where he was like, all right, everyone, I'm disbanding the group. And it was an interesting situation because I, like, I was always around. I mean, I was like always, always, always. I traveled with Miguel. I, like anything he did, I was there. And it was an incredible experience because he basically disbanded the group that we had. And then he said, okay, I'm creating something new the next, like two days later. And my whole body was like, nope, you're done. You're done. And I was like, but I, I need to continue with my people. I was like, nope, you're done. And it was a huge gift that Miguel gave me uh, and many of us of allowing me to then go out and find my way. And this is what he shared with us over and over again, is don't believe me, find your way, find your path, go make it your own. And so I was able then in 2000, I started a center in Berkeley, California, mm -hmm. and start, that was the first Toltec center and started just teaching full time. And 
it was an initiation to learn then how to embody everything that I had learned, all my own experiences, and then to weave that to offer and share with my students. So it was incredible continuation of teaching. Did you build it and they came? <laughs> like build I did. Dreams? Or was it a period of time before you really had a well-nurtured tribe and audience? Because you've got a pretty considerable following at this point. Yeah, it's really happened in stages. Like when I first started teaching, I did, I was so shy when I was young. I started teaching when I was 21 and I just feel like I got drafted. It was like, you teach this. And I'm like, but I'm the, ah. Um, but people just kept coming to me and saying, we want this wisdom and I really wanted to share. And so, you know, I had, I'd been teaching weekly and then I had, that had grown to teaching three classes a week traveling to different places in California. So when I opened the center, we had a really small group, but it grew very quickly because people felt the tools. And what I would do is I would travel with Miguel and go someplace and, and talk. Um, usually he'd bring me up on stage at some point. And then afterwards people would come to me and say, all right, where do you teach? How can we do this? And I realized I can't duplicate myself. There's too many people that want these teachings. So that's what led me to, to start training facilitators and sending them out across the country. So well, it's teaching, grown. It's grown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, and so the, so for instance, in this particular book that we're referring to in this interview, uh, you talk about the four chambers and the exercise, the practicing to create a warrior heart. Is, is there much more to what you offer people? Is there a whole system or different programs? How does that work? Yeah, there's a lot of different systems. So the Warrior Heart Practice is the newest one. Um, but I you know really what shifted my reach, we could say, or the, the amount of people that I was able to be in service to was the Warrior Goddess Training. So Warrior Goddess Training was a book that was written, I guess it's been seven years now. And it was, it was so powerful because it was one of those things where it went into the world and just did this. It just exploded because people knew, especially women, you know, it's designed for women. And I had so many women come to me and go, I don't even know what a warrior goddess is, but I need that. That's what <laughs> I, I need. want it. I'll have I want some of it. That. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so that teaching was really around learning to commit to yourself, learning to align with life. It was, it's a blend of the Toltec and the European shamanic traditions that I'd learned. And then warrior heart practice came out of working with students that were really struggling. And what I saw was really stuck in their stories and didn't know how to step out of them and how easy it is for us to go in a spin cycle. And so that book is a very specific practice of learning how to separate out our feelings from the story so that we're actually feeling our feelings without telling ourselves a story about the feelings. And then to be able to explore what's the story? What, what am I telling myself in my head? And it's amazing what stories we make up without even realizing what we're doing to ourselves. And then teaching people the difference between story and truth. How do you know if something's a story versus if it's actually true? So that's the third chamber is the truth chamber and learning how to differentiate story from truth. And then the fourth chamber is intent. What do you want in this particular situation? And then I teach people how to take their intent, merge it with their truth, and then come back to the story to see the story from a completely different perspective. And then finally close in the feeling chamber. So we're learning to become more somatically based rather than constantly in our head. So super efficient practice for getting out of stuck places and untangling the many knots that so many of us create between our emotional body and our stories, the places that we keep ourselves stuck. When you talk about story versus truth, it sounds somewhat like the Byron Katie work. Yeah. Do you resonate with that? I do. It's, it's an inqu inquiry practice. So Byron Katie's The Work is a really beautiful inquiry practice also to get to truth. And all inquiry practices are to help us get out of our stories and into our truth. And so this is one method that I found to be really effective because it brings us first to the feelings. A lot of people, if we were really careful, 
with spiritual traditions because sometimes spiritual traditions cause us to bypass our emotional body or bypass the, the stories we don't like and to try and make it like, I'm just going to make it better. And my work is so much about let's go through it. So you actually clean it up so that it doesn't re-arise. And that takes time and learning to have this incredible courage to face and be in relationship to our emotional body so that it's not dry. So many of us, our lives are driven by avoiding our emotions. Yeah. When I hear people say, oh, you're feeling what? Change your mind, change your state. Just, you know, it's that easy. Wow. Uh, that's not my experience on this planet personally. Um, emotions are energy. And I have always found the most profound change, relief, um, capacity, all of that is when I release something. And I figure on some level, you know, if source energy is perfect and created us like this, we would not be created with feelings if we were not meant to feel them. <laughs> exactly. There's yeah. gotta be some truth in that. There is. And it's so true. It's energy. And for many of us, our energy is stuck because we're holding all of this energy from the past, all these emotions we haven't processed. And I think about it like a backpack. If you can imagine having a backpack that's weighed down with all the emotions or all the stories that you never processed or didn't know what to do with. And our bodies are really wise. We just store stuff. Mm. But then we're carrying all this weight around, being dragged into the past. And so these practices are so important to help us empty the backpack, get current with our emotional body. So we're not reacting to the world from the past. We're responding with an, a clear, clean emotional body. And when we have that, the emotions move quickly. Which and is you mentioned beautiful. story versus truth. So what is the difference? And how do you even break it down when you're working with somebody? Yeah, that's why I love having the four chambers and they're, you know, we call it the warrior heart practice because you need the courage of a warrior and the compassion of your heart. Mm -hmm. And your heart has four chambers and each of them are incredibly important. And so each chamber is incredibly important as well. So your story, the truth isn't better than your story. It's just what's going to get you free. So the difference between the story chamber and the truth chamber is so often our stories are tied together with judgment and victimization and fear. Ah, ooh, say that again. That felt really profound. It's yeah. tied in, our stories are tied in with judgment and mm -hmm. victimization. Okay, good, yeah. good starting point. Yeah, and fear. And it's what I call often disaster mind. Ah. Our minds are rarely in the present moment re in response to what's actually happened. Our minds are worried about the past or beating ourselves about things that happened that we did wrong, or it's feeling anxious about the future. Most of us have these incredible disaster minds, very well-developed disaster minds, and we're also incredibly creative. So we tie up all these stories. And the truth, when you cross that line, what most of us do when we start to move towards the truth is we write a better story and call it the truth. And what I'm really helping support people in doing is understanding that the truth is incredibly simple. Like that's one hallmark of the truth, one sentence with a period at the end. So if you say like da 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 da, and then you have all of this Everything that's after the period is all story. So you get, it starts to be really simple. What's actually true? That's the story. This is what I know is true at this moment. And the other thing is your body recognizes the truth. So what when you, you hit the truth, you're, there's a resonance. I've seen this over and over again. That when you come to a truth, your body will relax. Your body will open, even if you don't like the truth. Mm. You know, I was navigating uh, a relationship and it's, it's a long story, but just the short part of it was that I realized that he got to choose. It was a time where he was choosing another woman and I, there's a lot of upset around it. Um, but I realized, I was like, he gets to choose who he falls in love with, period. Everything after that of like, I must not be enough. I'm getting too old today. Like all that was story. But the truth was he got to choose, period. 
I might not love that in the moment, but it's true. And my body, when I got that, I was like, oh, okay. And there's often two, you get different truths. So for me in that situation, I also hit the truth of I get to choose, period. I get to choose what I do next. And when we understand what the truth is, is in any situation, and another great example that I often use is if you have a friend that's constantly late, you now the feeling might be frustration or the might, feeling might be abandonment. And then the story is they don't really love me. Everybody's late. Nobody listens to me. I'm not worthy. Nobody cares. Like that's all story. What's true? You're My late. friend was late. <laughs> Period. That's what you know. That's the truth. And it also might be true, I feel hurt, period. Mm -hmm. But then what makes the magic, what makes us be able to transform our lives in really deep ways is that we then get clear about what's my intent? What do I want in this situation? So, and that really directs your choice and what you're gonna do next. So let's say that in my life, I was really navigating, speaking my truth versus in my life, I'm learning patience. So if my intent is patience, and I go back to the truth, my friend is late, and then I go back to the story, and what, what we start to see with the story is the story is never about what you think it's about. It might look like it's around the late friend, but it's probably also about not being seen as a kid or self-worth issue like all that gets tied in with the story and when we're willing to be brave and look we'll see the layers of the story and so if your word is patience and you know the truth my friend is late you might go back and go you know what it's I'm fine if they're late I'm just going to bring a book with me or I'm going to meditate in that time okay versus if your word is speaking my truth and setting boundaries and that's your intent right now in your life, you might have a different action that you would take in unwinding the story. How do you find out what your word is? Because that seems to be a, a starting point that can inform everything about the choices you make based on what you discover. Yeah, it's so true. When, you've get, when you go through the process of just being with whatever the feelings are, looking at what the story is and what the layers of the story. And I think about like when you're in the story chamber, you're an archeologist, you want to dig to see what's beneath the current manifestation of the story. And then when, once you then start to get clear on what your truth is, what I've seen is when people go into the intent chamber, they now have space and energy to be able to feel into their being, to really connect with their big soul is how I would say it. To, to know, ah, this is where I want to put my energy. And that might be love, that might be compassion, that might be presence, can be anything, play. But that because we're now freed up from the story and we're in more of a place of witness, we're then able to be more creative and in touch with our own inner guidance at that point so that we're responding rather than reacting. Mm. Yeah, responding is a powerful place. Reacting is definitely the victimization and a terrible feeling of being out of control. So I want to take this through a few uh, examples because I think this is really desirable for people right now. And of course, folks who are listening, you can get her book, The Warrior Heart Practice, A Simple Process, to Transform Confusion into Clarity and Pain into Peace by Heather Ashimara. And she'll take us through a little, hopefully will intrigue you more to get the book and practice more. So for people right now who really want to be centered, they really want to be strong in the face of challenge, which many people are experiencing at this point in our history, how can they accomplish that using the work you're talking about, either by an example or just, you know, generally, how can they take themselves through this to find some kind of stasis and deepening and anchor, if you will? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's such a great question. Well, I would start with looking at what's the main suffering that's happening. And 
you know, in, in regards to the pandemic, people have anxiety, they have a sense of being out of control, uh, they have a sense of not knowing what's going to happen. And so let's just pick that feeling sense of being out of control. So to, to work the warrior heart practice, what you would do is start by getting quiet, sitting, and just asking one question, what am I feeling? To give yourself permission to feel the sense of being out of control. Where is it in your body? And this is what we're doing is we're separating out the feeling from the story. So the story is going to come in, you're feeling out of control because, uh, you know, and you just go, thank you for sharing mind. Like, wait, we'll get to you in a moment. How am I feeling? And what you might realize as you breathe into your body is, wow, I have a lot of tension in my belly. Breathe into the tension. And then you might notice, I feel, um, it's a, a common thing. So the feeling sense of out of control, I feel anxiety. Or I feel a sense of numbness. Wow, I actually feel kind of numb in my hands. Like I've been grasping at something. And so you would just go through and really let yourself somatically experience what's happening in your body. Not what you wish was happening. But what's actually going on without trying to understand it, fix it, or intellectualize it. And you don't have to spend a ton of time there. This isn't like, let's spend two days. It's like, just sit for five minutes, set a timer if you need to. Be with the discomfort. So many of us spend our lives running from our emotions and doing what I think of as exiting our emotional body. And so to turn to it and just give yourself permission to feel and look at what else is happening is such a huge gift. And then once you've let yourself feel, then you step into the story chamber. And the question is, what am I telling myself? And we'll probably then get to see what your disaster mind is up to. Um, you know, and so many of us have financial concerns at this time or fear around our health or fear around the health of our beloveds or our family or confusion around what we're supposed to be doing. Um, confusion around all the, the different information. And so to then separate from the story, the feeling, excuse me, to then just go, what am I telling myself right now? And to give yourself permission to look at where you're feeling victimized, where you're judging yourself or others, what's, what your mind is telling you. It's huge. And then what is it connected to? You know, with an archaeologist, an archaeologist goes to a dig and doesn't, doesn't just pick up the first shard of pottery and go, I found the information. We don't need to dig. You know, you know, that's the beginning. So actually the anxiety or the story about COVID, I can guarantee there's a deeper story happening. It looks like it's the pandemic. It's not. I mean, there's a definitely pandemic stuff layer for sure. I'm not, I don't want to negate that. And there's older content and all of us are dealing with this. There's a lot of older, what I think of as oil, that's rising right now to be processed. So we have to be willing to look at what's the larger story. What's my mind doing in relationship? Can you give us some examples, some uh, COVID oil rising examples <laughs> of what for some people that you found that you're working with in groups or otherwise that's been? Yeah. So one is around the financial piece of it's, you know, the economy is going to tank completely. We're going to go into recession. Um, I'm not going to be able to pay my rent. Now, some of these may be based in the truth, but some of them are not. Okay, so the difference between what the story is, I mean, the truth might be, I don't have money to pay my rent, period. That would be truth if it's actually true. And if you have that truth, you would you then navigate that. But what most of us do is, oh my God, what if I can't? Or what if my mom gets this and I can't be with, and then we create the whole story while your mom is fine, mm -hmm. right? So it's, this isn't to say things don't happen, they do. But we create tremendous suffering for ourselves by making up worst case scenarios. And just and then running them over and over and over again, sometimes not even realizing we're doing that to ourselves. And we drain all of our energy to be creative because we're in fear. Mm. And so it's 
you know, another story that I can think of is around, um, you know, the health piece and, and also, you know, I've been watching this with a friend of mine of like, I'm going to be stuck in my house forever. I'm never going to get to travel again. What's the truth? We don't know how long this is going to last. We don't, period. Now, I'm really a big fan of like, put the period in, <laughs> take a breath. And then you can be more creative of how to navigate what's true. But when you're in the spin cycle of the story, it's really hard to see it. It just feels like this incredible drain. Well, this is very apropos. I'm going to read something to you because we had a podcast listener write in to you in advance. And I will read you, this is a story and a question that she's looking for help from. Her name is Jan and she wrote in, Hi, Heather Ash. I saw the promo of your upcoming interview, so I bought your book, The Warrior Heart, to read in advance. Your book asked me to bring up a trigger and take it through the four chambers. I seem to be stuck in navigating success through or successfully through. Can you help? I was with my boyfriend for a year and three months. We had a breakup in January and it was rough on me. He extricated his heart and being from my life in a slow, grueling way. I went through many feelings of grief and anger. He had met a woman through a party I took him to and befriended her. They did not date or sleep together, but during the demise of our relationship and after the breakup, they hung out a lot and went to many cool events, just like he used to do with me. He began hiking with her and her dogs like he used to do with me. I know he found her attractive, although nothing happened romantically between them. A few months later, he and I established a friendship. And after some time, we began a sexual romantic relationship once again, although now it's much better and very healed. I am struggling because he is still friends with the woman whom I feel he chose to replace me. He and I are pretty much living together at this point, although we have not said the words boyfriend, girlfriend. And he wants her to come over and visit as friends from time to time. I myself have done deep inner work over my lifetime and I am aware and a healer myself, but this one has me stuck. Mm. Yeah. Every time she texts him, I am triggered and upset. I think if I did not come back in his life, he would be with her. Or I have thoughts like I want her permanently out of his life and our life. I feel threatened. I'm embarrassed to think this way. His relationship with her caused me to feel that I was not special, that he did not grieve our loss, and I was replaceable. To be fair, I had a tumultuous childhood without stability and an absent father. Also, in my previous relationship, which lasted 10 years, my ex-boyfriend cheated on me several times, which has left me feeling and acting in ways in this now current relationship that I never have thought or behaved mm -hmm. like before. I don't like these thoughts and behaviors, and yet I want to control, thing, control things and drive her away but there is nothing I can do but let things play out on some level. Reading your book, I have felt successful at looking at my feelings, the first chamber, and extricating myself, talking myself down off each emotional or action-driven ledge. But the truth is I am triggered over and over and over again. Can you please help with your wonderful Tokai work? Thanks for all you do, Jan. Mm. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Powerful story. So first, just holding you in my heart around the, mm -hmm. the challenge, because really relationships are the most, some of the most difficult journeys that we pass through because our hearts involved because, and then there's also all of our fear of abandonment and the childhood issues. So what I would say to you, Jan, and to anybody who's listening that can resonate, because I'm sure many of us can, of a past experience or a present experience of feeling not special, of fear of being abandoned, of, of not feeling we can trust 
somebody else or that we can't trust ourselves, of jealousy and of having these irrational, all of us can relate at some level because we're human. And because also we have big stories in the culture, in what we call the dream of the planet, there's huge stories around relationships and especially competition between women. We've been trained as women to fight against each other for what's perceived as scarce resources, which is love. And so to understand you're navigating a lot of different levels. So it's not going to work to just go through the practice once and think, okay, I've gone through it. We should be done now. But to understand you are unraveling a very deep wound that's not just yours. This is a deep wound of the, fe of the female, of the women around competition, around jealousy, around scarcity. And if you can keep facing that and being vulnerable around that, and no, it may take you years to unpack this one, and that's okay. You know, and for all of you that are listening, that there's some wounding that we, we have that is going to take time to unpack because it's not just our wounding. It's wounding we're also carrying from our families, from other experiences that we've had in the past, from past life, from our ancestors, from the way we've been domesticated. And this, what you're sharing, is partially around the domestication. So where I would invite you to go next is to keep doing the work, the beautiful work that you're doing of letting yourself have the feelings and just sit with the jealousy without doing anything else. And, and to go, what is, what's made up, what is jealousy made up of? Because jealousy is not one feeling. Jealousy is insecurity. Jealousy is comparison. Jealousy, there's, there's story wrapped in it. So to keep looking at what else is part of the story. He's going to abandon me, story. He's going to pick her, story. And this isn't to make, um, again, to minimize it. It's painful. But what's true? You know, we can go through the story, but let's also step into what's true. He's choosing you period. In this moment, he is choosing you. And you are choosing him. And who knows what's going to happen next? None of us know what's going to happen next around anything is the truth, right? The relationship's not going to last forever. Even if you both, even if you, you know, spend the next 40 years together, one of you is going to die period. That's just the truth. One of you is going to abandon the other in one way or not. And I, abandonment's the wrong word, but leave. And there's, there's deep work to do here for all of us around facing endings, around facing death, of being in relationship to the mystery. And, and the truth is that you don't know what's going to happen. And that you're choosing to be in this relationship and use the relationship to heal all the old stories that are getting, that are been brought up. And so instead of seeing her as your enemy, can you shift it even just a little bit to see her as a gift that's going to help you get more solid and more strong and more in your power? Because you're now going to go heal the old story around your fear of not being special around abandonment so that you learn to not abandon yourself because that's what we really are afraid of because we do it to ourselves all the time oh so yeah. i'm so glad you said that boy that was that almost brought me to tears honestly mm. hearing all of what you shared and the profundity of the woman piece and the ancestor piece and the personal childhood peace and so forth. What I'm curious about is for somebody like Jan and others who are listening, the one thing that brings this very like niggly is suppose this woman does come over, you know, as a friend and she's in their home, even though obviously it's the guy's home, but she's living there now too. So how does she presence that? Because that is like, bam, you know, in her face to have to deal with that, with all of what could come up, the comparison and the insecurity and the, you know, yeah. he's mine and, and we don't want, I don't want you here and all of that minutiae and hugeness 
it's a lot to go through. It's How a lot to be, yeah. like show up for herself and yes. also be human, you know, and simple. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so, so true is the first thing I would do is, is to have a really deep conversation with her partner mm. and to say, I feel really vulnerable and I feel scared. And, and this is what's going on for me. And not you are making me feel scared or she's making me feel vulnerable. I'm feeling vulnerable. I'm scared that you're going to pick her. I'm afraid I'm going to be abandoned. And I, it's so hard. I feel so much jealousy and I feel really embarrassed by it. To just be able to, again, not put the emotion on the other person, but just to say, look, this is what's going on for me. This is what's happening for me emotionally. This is what's happening for me mentally. And you're not telling the other person so they fix it. You're sharing it so you get to be more intimate with them. Mm -hmm. and, and then it would be, I, I'm trying to figure out how to hold space for this and just know it's hard for me. And I'm not asking you to do anything different but I may need a little bit more time or I may need to not be here or I may need to talk with her separately and just have a heart to heart with this woman with my vulnerabilities. Um, and that's scary. That's scary to do. That's part of the, the healing process. If you want to deepen a relationship and there's that insecurity, the way to deepen the relationship is to bring it in between you what we often do in relationships is we dump it on the other person. I should not be feeling this way. You should fix it. You should get her out of my, you know, our life so that I feel safe. But the truth is you're never going to feel safe because there's other women in the world, right? No. And I'm speaking, you know, and again, not to make light of this, I have had some really difficult relationship situations that have been incredibly challenging. And so I'm looking from the other side of that, of like what I wish I could have done differently at the time that I wasn't able to. And that what, where I also like, like grew and stood up and was able to show up and realize, oh, this is my own insecurity. How do I love myself through this? And so I think that's the biggest thing is the question becomes, how do I love myself through this? How do I not beat myself up for being jealous? How do I honor where I'm at? How do I take it slow? How do I ask for my needs without demanding, but just say, you know, this would help. But then you have to figure out what do you, what do you need? Mm. You may not get it. Right. But yeah. that, to have that, again, vulnerable, this is self-vulnerability of like, I really need to feel safe all the time. I need to be the only special one. Mm -hmm. then, then it's like, okay, how do you make yourself the special one? How do you stop abandoning yourself and make yourself special? Like, sweetie, I promise I won't abandon you. Mm -hmm. Because so often, again, we're, we're creating worst case scenarios that we're abandoning ourselves over. And everything changes when we come back into relationship with ourselves and are like, hi, beloved, I won't abandon you. I won't abandon you. Mm. I'm here. And I, this is scary, but we can do this together. That will start to change everything. But it takes time. This is epic. I want to make sure to close the loop on this example in regards to the con potential conversation she might have with the, the other woman, because you teach goddess things. How would that unfold? How would somebody go about doing that? What I would say is that it might be like a text, you know, to, to check of how to do the conversation. But again, it would be in that place of vulnerability of, I really want to honor your relationship with, the, you know, with Fred, let's make up his name, with Fred, and I'm feeling insecurity. Would you be willing to just sit and talk with me? Because what you need to, what you want to get to is, you know, there's different ways to go about it. It may be, it's a deal breaker. It may be this, and you've got to really delve what's true for you. It may be, it's not okay for him to have women friends, deal breaker, end of relationship. And that might be your truth. And so figure that out now. If it's not a deal breaker, but it's scary then that's what you get to navigate. And again, it would be about being 
vulnerable with her and befriending her. He obviously wants to be friends with her. And if he's willing, if he wants to bring over, he wants her to be friends with his beloved too. He wants to share what he's, you know, the gifts that he's found with his friend. So that's one way to look at it is how do you then go, okay, this might be a win rather than a loss. I might get another friend. Now that's a different story. <laughs> it's a different story, exactly. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay. So warrior's heart, this practice, can you do this with children? Can people teach their kids this practice? Yes, absolutely. It's so good to teach this with kids. And you start off really where they are. So if you have really young children, it's about asking them how they're feeling, having pictures that they can point out, giving them permission to have their feelings, to express them, playing with them, like play acting feelings is a great thing to do. And then as they get older, you can start asking them questions around what's your mind telling you? What's the story? Like to describe what a story is and to, to ask questions like, well, did that really happen or did that happen inside your head? So they start to start to understand there's stories I make up in my head and there's what happened. And you can bring it to really specific situations. Like, you know, you think Molly's mad at you, but what actually happened? And have them describe and then to start to brainstorm, well, what else could have been going on for Molly at the time? And that gives the kids an understanding of the difference between making assumptions basically and putting stories onto situations and being able to ask good questions of themselves and of other people. And then as they mature, you can keep the dialogue going of the difference between a story and truth and how do you ascertain that and continue to help them build their emotional development. One of my favorite ways to work with adults and kids is to print out, go just go on the internet and do a Google search for list of emotions or faces of emotions or images of emotions. There's tons of different resources of how, what kind of emotions we have. And if you print that out and stick it on the fridge, you can then talk to your kids about, oh, I'm feeling disappointed. What does disappointed feel like? Um, or I'm feeling frustrated or, you know, do you feel, which, which one do you feel? And we're, we're so often, we don't have good emotional liter literacy so we need to teach ourselves and teach our kids as well. Yeah, I remember seeing those charts. Angry. Yes. Yeah, surprised. Yeah, yeah, surprised. Yeah, surprised. Exactly. It's, it's great. It's great. Yeah. So, and what about you, Heather Ash? Here we are at the end. What kind of daily ritual or practice do you engage in that keeps you really centered, really grounded, really widened back? Mm. Really, my deep practice is around creating the sacred in everything. So really being aware as I navigate my life and seeing everything is sacred. So for me, like cleaning the toilet and speaking in front of, you know, 400 people is the same energy. I'm bringing my full self to it. I'm seeing it as a sacred act and that there isn't a separation between this is a good thing and this is a bad thing. It's all, be we're, we're so blessed to be in this body and to have all the experiences that we get to have, even the hard ones. So that really is my practice, is, is coming to everything with love and compassion. And this is Dare to Dream. So what do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Oh, I'm so excited about this land that I have the honor of stewarding. And the, the dream is around being able to bring people together to learn how to build and learn how to be in nature and learn how to be in community. And so I just, it's been a long time dream for me to have a center, a retreat space, a hermitage, a uh, place that people could be on the land. And so that's my dream is that in a couple years that we'll have a really vibrant place for people to rest into and come home to themselves. What an amazing auspicious time to be building something like that. Like how could you have planned that, right? Yes, yeah, it is, it's remarkable. It really is. All the timing of everything is quite unbelievable right now. That's so beautiful. What would you like the listeners to know here at the end? What can you impart? Be 
gentle with yourself. Mm. There are so many stories that we are unweaving right now around our ancestors, around our culture, around our countries, um, around what we call the dream of the planet, and around ourselves as individuals. So if we bring both fierce compassion, a love for the truth, and gentleness to ourselves, you know, we need to give ourselves time to integrate, especially at these times. There's so much happening. More rest, more integration, go slower. And use these times when there's so much up, there's so much material that's up right now to really befriend your mind. That would be the advice. Very, very good. Very, very good. Uh, that could be on replay. I think that would be a wonderful mantra for people to remember right now to unravel the stories, look at the piece of the story that belongs to them that is coming up to be healed. That was absolutely my experience in the beginning of this, like, wow. I was getting spiritual downloads and at the same time, like grieving and here I am an extrovert and being alone. And I mean, it was a lot, but I mean, I would take to the streets and my walks with my, my mask and my dog and like, tears and running down my face and just like I had to do what I had to do, making videos with friends and just uh, the enormity coming up out of me that felt ancient, but it was there and there was no denying, uh, facing things on a collective level and absolutely on an individual level. So very profound and I love this suggestion of being kind to yourself, going slower, more rest, more baths, more, you know, whatever's soft to you to show up for. I have a few people in my life, I'm so shocked. They're like, I'm so busy. You know, I can't stop. Like they took this to be this time where they're making this major deep dive into work, which on some level is awesome. Obviously they're going to come out the other side and have this, you know, whole new, I don't know, program services, but I don't know what's on the other side for that to be received. And, and I somehow always have the feeling something's being missed if you're still in that energy, that hamster on a wheel, that there's no space and capacity you're missing. Because this is a big picture going on right now and really yeah. missing that vital piece of healing for all of us. Yeah, I really agree. To take the opportunity to slow down right now is, is a big gift to ourselves and I think to everyone else. So yeah. we can access our creativity and our vision and possibilities. Mm. Deep in relationships with ourselves and others. And so your website is Heather Ash Amara, A-M-A-R-A dot com. And you can check out more about the amazing Heather Ash, as well as a reminder on her book, which is, there we go, <laughs> The Warrior Heart Practice, beautiful book. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thanks so much, Debbie, for having me. It's been such a joy and blessings to everyone that got to be part of this. Thank you. Yeah, I hope everybody received a lot. You can subscribe to the Dare to Dream podcast. This is your weekly number one transformation conversation. You can go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger as well as Apple Podcasts. Please leave a five-star review and subscribe. We love you for it. Next week, James Redfield is coming back. James asked to do a four-part series on the show so he can really talk about what's going on and offer some guidance to everybody here for some wisdom during these very auspicious times. Thanks everybody for joining us today. And remember, don't just dare to dream. Dare to make all your dreams into your reality. This truly is your time. <laughs>